Back to you, Christopher. I think I saw uh, Sullivan's travels. Uh, I was probably in my early 20s. I was uh, an actor. And it, it, it struck me as unusual at the time because it, it didn't seem like other movies that, the, that I had seen. This is the scene where uh, he has uh, two butlers and uh, one of them, uh, this is Eric Bloor, uh, who, who was uh, a butler in hunt, well, a lot of movies. Uh, he, he butled, if that's the word, uh, for Fred Astaire and he, he, he butled for other people. Um, and there's another butler that comes in that, that gives Joel McRae a, uh, a speech, which is, is to me one of the most unusual things about this film. It, uh, it is giving an, an incredibly important piece of uh, information and um, insight to a, to a somewhat minor character which is also someone who, uh, th this means that the, the, the director, the writer, trusts the material and doesn't have to give everything to the stars, which happens so much now. Good morning, Burroughs. How do you like it? I don't like it at all, sir. Fancy dress, I take it. Well, what's the matter with it? I have never been sympathetic to the caricaturing of the poor and needy, sir. Who's caricaturing? Burroughs doesn't know about the expedition, sir. I'm going out on the road to find out what it's like to be poor and needy, and then I'm going to make a picture about it. If you'll it. permit me to say so, sir, the subject is not an interesting one. The poor know all about poverty, and only the morbid rich would find the topic glamorous. But I'm I think in, the, in that paragraph, he, he sums up a, 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 an amazingly profound thought, which is the basis of the, the entire film, and it's... It's somewhat thrown away by giving it to this uh, to this character, and he's done it. He's, he does it very straight, and uh, sends this uh, director on his way with this uh, philosophy. You see, sir, rich people and theorists, who are usually rich people, think of poverty in the negative, as the lack of riches, as disease might be called the lack of health, but it isn't, sir. Is Michael McKean? Yeah, Robert Grieg, who played uh, the butler in the beginning, uh, Sullivan's butler, and he's uh, you know, got some other pieces in there, but he has this wonderful speech about, don't do it, don't even think about it. Poverty's not something you can step into. Poverty's something that goes back, it's about the history. And of course, that's, that's really the moral. You know, you can't be a dilettante when you're talking about reality. You can try tennis, but you can't try starvation. It gets a little bit gruesome every once in a while. And in Sullivan's Travels, you see, you know, you see this attempt, this, you, see, you see good intentions pave the way to three different kinds of hell. And then the one that he was really looking for, he falls into by accident, because it's taken out of his control. And I think that's, that's really the point of the movie, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, we only get to the cockeyed caravan by way of ending the movie and, you know, sending us all home. A lot of this was done. Here's some examples right here with William Demarest and, uh, of course, Franklin Pangborn and, and the whole gang here. Even in a film like this, where uh, the door opens and six well-known character faces come in, they, take, they make use of the shorthand. They make use of the shorthand. We know this about William Demarest. They know if Billy Gilbert comes in, there's going to be a certain kind of trouble or a certain kind of fun or whatever. And we ride with them for that length of time that it takes their character to be, you know, to deliver what they're going to deliver. And that was their job. He used all the best people, and, you know, he made use of everything he had available at Hollywood, in Hollywood. And he, and he also told a story in a responsible and yet surprising way, you know. And I think it was a tough act to follow. A lot of writers who became directors after that didn't quite know how to do it. Or they thought that because they were good at one craft, that it was kind of a, another version of that craft that they would be moving into. Sturgis just, you know, he just kind of knew, knew how to do this. I didn't see this film until, I didn't see Sullivan's Travels until I was in college. And uh, I went to, a, joined a film society and they showed us all the movies that we, we missed by only watching, you know, westerns and uh, The Great Escape. Later we found out The Great Escape was a good movie, too, so we were, we were able to appreciate that one on its own. But this is another Sturges we're talking about now. Um, I had seen Hail the Conquering Hero. I think that was the only one that I had seen at that point, the only Sturges film I'd seen. And uh, people were really hyping me on this movie and saying it was a great movie and everything. And I think, 
at the time, when I was 18 years old, I kind of... It fell a little bit short of the perfection I was expecting. Uh, you know, I expected really every moment to, you know, to work like clockwork. And now that I'm older, it does work like clockwork. I think my clock was a little fast at that time. You know, things offended me like, uh, you know, the cockeyed caravan speech at the end, just like the end of The Great Dictator offended me. It's like you went through this whole movie and you really kind of did it with the acting and the faces and the, and the story. And now you got to tell us, you know, you got to, you know, you got to do that. And I've become a lot more forgiving of that kind of writing over the years because you know, it, it, it's become apparent to me that there's, there's a good way to do that and a bad way to do that. The lighthouse keeper on San Clemente Island. Ask him what his daughter's doing. I said the lighthouse keeper on San Clemente Island. That's a strange line, isn't it? It's a strange joke. It's like, if he's a lighthouse keeper, how could he have a daughter, I guess, is the joke. Now, this sequence, which, which, when it takes off, it really takes off, I mean, physically. And we got the kid here, who is, of course, doing his cameo in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The current release. The kid with the, kid with the car saves the day, or sort of, or just screws it up. Now, this particular kind of chaos, it's this controlled element to it. I mean, indoors is moving too fast. Now, in the closing credits, of course, the uh, African-American gentleman in the kitchen is referred to as Colored Chef. And he's the one, it's, they're, all taking, they're all taking a big bath here, but he's the one who gets the messiest. And I remember seeing this as a kid, seeing this when I was uh, in school, and thinking, I don't like seeing the black guy getting, you know, all crapped all over. Everybody else is too, but he's getting messier somehow. And I remember seeing this and being and thinking, well, this is kind of outré, you know. It's kind of like the bank dick, you know. The bank dick got all this great comedy and a very similar sequence here. But I remember seeing this and thinking, wow, they could have maybe trimmed his stuff out of here. Now I don't feel that these days. I don't know whether I've become just a big jerk like everyone else, or why this now makes me laugh. And the lady with the bloomers. <laughs> That's so choreographed. All of this stuff. But anyway, the first time I saw this, uh, the second time I saw this, rather, I saw it on TV, and this part was intact, including that. But what was cut was the entire black church. The entire sequence of the black church... We, it had it began you know, with, the, with the cartoon starting. So they cut all this very, very positive speech that this black preacher gives, but they keep the clown in there. I always thought that was kind of odd. So that was just something the TV did, that just kind of local TV did. I think the early 40s were the best time for this kind of cross-country chase. The bank dick was 40, I guess, 1940. And this is kind of a second cousin to this chase. 